Okay. So please sit down. Session starting. Okay, so we resume the, the session with Er Bellinger, who is going to talk about the inverse analysis of astroseismic data. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Earl Bellinger. Um, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you today about this uh, fascinating to topic. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with Mike Thompson uh, two times, both uh, on this nice topic, and um, as, as everyone says, he's, he was really a wonderful guy. So um, it's, it's an honor to be able to talk about this topic. So uh, inverse problems in astroseismology are not so different from inverse problems in helioseismology. Uh, uh, Goff and Thompson wrote a review article in 1991, one of, by the way, one of the best papers I've ever read. It's hard to find, but I can highly recommend it, in which they discuss essentially what an inverse problem in helioseismology is. And as you all know by now, uh, essentially we want to take the seismic data to reveal some properties of the solar interior. For astroseismology, we just substitute the sun with other stars. Now, there are unique differences when it comes or unique challenges when it comes to astroseismic data over helioseismic data. Here you can see MDI data of the sun, uh, and I've highlighted the mode set we get from the Bison uh, Sun as a Star network, and then also the, the mode set that we get from Kepler data of perhaps the best observed uh, Kepler star. Um, and you can see that the mode set is extremely limited with degrees L equals 3 and less, uh, and the lower turning points of these modes are, are actually confined to the deep interior. That's, a, that's a, a fortunate thing about astroseismology is that we get information about the, the stellar core, uh, although we don't get so much about the stellar surface. Now, before I proceed with the uh, astronomical analysis, um, due, to, due to Mike's interest in the mathematics of inverse problems, I thought I'd just pay a, a small homage to the actual pure math to, and give a, a two-minute uh, description with some, uh, I think, really fun examples. So uh, a forward problem uh, is always uh, kind of dual to an inverse problem. We usually think about the, the forward problem being a model that generates some data deterministically, and then uh, when we want to solve an inverse problem, we take that data and we try to go back and interpret it in terms of, uh, of the model or, or, or get a model. Um, now, this is always complicated, well, not always complicated, but often very complicated because we can have a situation like this where some models lead to the same data and some data uh, don't lead to any model at all. So this case with data C, this is like um, when you look at the lawn and you see that it's wet, you don't know if it's rained or if the sprinkler ran. So we have to take into account these, these possibilities. So um, a, a well-posed problem it has a solution that exists, is unique, and is stable. So here's some just quick examples. We can think of a linear model. A forward problem would be generating points from that model. Everyone can do this. The, an inverse problem, which is well-posed, would be to find the line corresponding to those points. Uh, this is a well-posed inverse problem. But if we perturb one of these points, we then get an ill-posed inverse problem. There's no line that goes through all of these points. We cannot solve this. Of course, we could do something like find the least square solution, but that's changing the problem, right? This line does not go through all of these points. And it's not the only solution that we could take. We could find the least absolute value solution. We could use the Thiel-Sen estimator, lots of stuff. The, the end of the story is that we have to change the problem. Here's another uh, inverse problem. Finish the sequence, one, two, three, four, six. Could be Ulam numbers, seven, some crazy sequence of primes, 10 if we're counting a base 10, or a base five. There's lots of stuff. The most boring one is, of course, the natural numbers. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you to think a little bit. Uh, it's kind of simple math, but it, it, it's a fun example. Uh, now, let's say we have this uh, coupled system of equations, x is a plus b, y is a plus b times some very small correction. Um, now, the forward problem, if we put in some numbers for A and B, we can obviously get out X and Y, no problem at all. Um, but let's say we want to solve the inverse problem. We observe in nature X and Y are both 2. Now, you can substitute these in, and you see clearly that A has to be 2 and B has to be 0. No problem at all. But now, let's say we uh, observed a very small difference to Y. Then the solution changes discontinuously uh, for, to a is 1 and B is 1. And if you're confused looking at this, it's because your brain uh, can't accept that uh, a tiny change, remember, an arbitrarily small change to Y 
leads to a completely different solution. So that's the problem we're faced with. Now, in the context of astronomy and in, in astro seismology, there are actually many different inverse problems. Um, I'd like to focus on uh, one in particular, which is structure inversions. I'll just mention the, the, the others very briefly. Rotation inversions, we've just heard about. Uh, we'll hear about later again today. Um, uh, integrated quantity inversions. So th this started with the work of uh, Daniel Reese, who was the PhD student of Mike Thompson in Sheffield. His, uh, his PhD student, uh, Gail Bulgin, uh, continued this work, and they've produced a, a good, good set of literature on uh, integrated quantity inversions. And there's also glitch analysis. Now, most people don't think of this first point, evolution inversions, as being an inverse problem, but of course it clearly is, um, because we have a forward model, which is the theory of stellar evolution. We use that to compute deterministically based on some set of input parameters, the evolution of a star. This, and then when we see a star in the sky, we would like to interpret those observations in the context of stellar evolution theory. And so this is the, the problem that is inverse to that, that, that forward problem. So here on the left, you can see Hertzsprung-Russell diagram with uh, evolutionary tracks varied in uh, initial mass. Um, you can see that uh, tracks overlap the same point uh, in space, for example, right here. So if you only had the luminosity and temperature of the star, you don't know if the lawn is wet because it rained or if the sprinkler ran. So here are some observations of solar type stars observed by Kepler. Um, uh, fortunately, we don't only have uh, temperature and luminosity, but we have seismic data. So over here is the famous CD diagram, um, which shows how uh, stars uh, evolve in their pulsation properties throughout the main sequence. And so using that information, we can get uh, better constraints, for example, on the age and so on of these stars. But as you increase the dimensionality of your problem, uh, the, the degeneracies build up. So for example, you could uh, um, vary the initial metallicity for independently of the initial helium abundance, vary the mixing length parameter, so on and so forth. And then you get into the regime where you need individual frequencies uh, to, to say something definitive. So uh, stated mathematically, we have a, a forward operator, which is uh, the stellar evolution theory. It takes these initial parameters, uh, here I've called them x, uh, and at a certain age, they will output these, these properties like the luminosity and the temperature and the metallicity uh, at the surface. And if you couple this with a pulsation code, you get out some frequencies as well. And so we want to find the models that correspond to these observations. Now, there's a vast literature on this. Probably uh, everyone is familiar with at least some of these uh, papers. Um, the most popular approach is to optimize the residuals between uh, your best fitting stellar model, or between the, the models uh, and the observations that you got. So put in different values of, uh, for your stellar evolution uh, model, like different masses, and uh, you optimize that in the age. Uh, to try to get uh, uh, the best fitting model. Um, so there are various approaches that you can take to do this. For example, you can use a genetic algorithm or you can use Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, Jörn and I had a letter in AppJ accepted last week where we used Mon uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo to um, do just this, uh, except with the goal of constraining the cosmic time variation of the gravitational constant, uh, just using this very same approach. Now, the other possibility is to try to model uh, the inverse operator of, uh, of, of stellar evolution theory. Now, um, this, because it's a, an, a, an inverse problem, this function is not guaranteed to exist, but we can build approximations to it using machine learning. This actually started in uh, the late 90s, which is kind of cool to see, uh, using a neural net based only on the HR diagram, but uh, there's been a revival in the last few years. Um, uh, doing this with astro seismic data. Uh, so regardless of the approach that you take, you can get something like this out. So these are 97 of the best stars that were observed by the Kepler mission. And I've, uh, I've shown the relative uncertainty that you can get through evolutionary modeling of, of these stars. And so you can see that uh, radii of these stars, we can constrain to about 1.5%, uh, masses to about 3.5%, ages to 11%, and the theoretical parameters are, are a bit more uncertain. Yeah, just, just to be totally clear, each of these points is, is an individual one of these stars that we, that we model. You know, we solve the evolution inverse problem for them, and we get out an uncertainty on these parameters. Okay, but this is all just, um, you know, uh, the, the background for the structure inversion problem, because what we want to wonder is whether or not these, uh, these stellar structures that we get out from evolutionary modeling 
are the actually correct structures of these stars. So this is the predicted internal structure of a star. Its name is SAXO2, or KIC6225718. Um, this is a star that's about 20% more massive than the sun, and stellar evolution theory predicts it to harbor a convective core. So here I've shown uh, the squared, uh, well, I've shown the isothermal speed of sound. Um, the, the square of that is, uh, is U, uh, which is the ratio of pressure to density inside of the stellar interior, right? And so we, we want to wonder if, if, if this structure is the correct one. Um, but in fact, we can clearly see that it's not the correct one if we compare the mode frequencies of this model to the mode frequencies of the star. So here I've shown in a shell diagram, I think this might be the first shell diagram of the meeting, um, but essentially the, this diagram shows frequency against uh, frequency modulo the large frequency separation. Um, and I've labeled the degrees of the modes in this figure. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, although the measurements are, are pretty close to the model, or maybe I should say that in reverse, there are highly significant discrepancies. The error bars for almost all of these modes are too small to see on this uh, scale. Um, some of these discrepancies are greater than eight sigma, and this is after correcting for surface effects. The, the right panel shows the same thing for the same star, uh, but here using the astroseismic frequency ratios, which are independent of the outer layers of the star. Uh, and this tells the same story. We get kind of broad agreement, but actually the details are wrong. We have significant discrepancies between theory and observation. And because we've subtracted off the surface layers or the surface term, we know that these discrepancies come from a difference in the internal structure of the star, uh, a, a difference between the internal structure of the star and, and the model. So back in 2002, uh, Mike and Jörn, uh, wrote this paper on inverting asteroseismic data where they, they showed this nice schematic. Uh, this shows a landscape of stellar evolution models. And the idea is that you pick out one or two models that are uh, best fitting to, to the seismic data, but these aren't exactly fitting because none of the models uh, we've seen um, can fit all of the observed frequencies. And then you use those and apply kind of small corrections to get to the actual structure of the star, to obtain a, a, either a model that pulsates in the same way as does the star, or localized measurements of what the sound speed would need to be in various areas of the interior in order to reproduce um, the, the seismic data that we witness. So we've seen this equation uh, uh, a few times already in this meeting in a few different forms. So I'll give my hand at explaining it one more time. The idea is that we want to compare this best fitting model to the, the star that we've observed, and we want to infer from the differences in the frequencies what the differences are in the internal structure. So this term is the relative difference in the mode frequencies, and, and, and uh, actually this is just for one mode frequency, right? We will have one of these equations for every single mode that we've observed. And then we have an integral which adds up the differences over the internal structure. So this is the relative difference in the uh, isothermal speed of sound, which is the quantity that we're interested in. And then this is a sensitivity function that belongs to this particular mode of oscillation. The sensitivity function tells us if the speed of sound were to change in the stellar interior, how would, uh, how would the frequency of this mode change, right? And so I've shown uh, uh, some example kernels down below. Um, now, as Sarbani mentioned yesterday, through an assumption of the equation of state, we gain access to helium kernels. These are extremely useful because as you can see uh, from the x-axis scale in the right panel, uh, these kernels only have sensitivity to the outer layers of the star, which means that if we can deduce some difference in the inner layers, which is where we have sensitivity with astroseismic data, we can confine those differences to be differences in the speed of sound. The normal helioseismic inversions Sarbani showed examples with uh, sound speed and density. Well, they're just too complicated. We don't have a rich enough data set to do those kinds of inversions yet. So, uh, so now we wish to uh, solve this problem. So as is clear from these mathematics, uh, if the kernel function had amplitude only in one region in the interior, right, if it were a delta function, and, and the frequency of that mode was different uh, between the model and star, the speed of sound in that region of the interior would be different between the model and the star. But unfortunately, there's amplitude all over the interior, and so we have to take a, a more clever approach. 
so there are several approaches to, um, to solving the inverse problem. Unfortunately, the regularized least squares approach uh, is not applicable because it requires you to resolve uh, all or the majority of the stellar interior, which we simply do not have the data for in the astro-seismic case. Mike Thompson was instrumental in uh, developing further the OLA method, which was first introduced uh, to, to tackle geo geological inversions in the late 60s by Bacchus and Gilbert. That's actually the approach we'll use here. And I'll just mention that uh, Ian Roxborough and um, Sergei Voronsov uh, developed this differential response technique, uh, which they showed on simulated data, but has not yet been applied to actual observations. So now um, you heard uh, some descriptions of the OLA method. I'd like to give a, a, a short illustration visually of how it works. So here again is a shell diagram of a star. On the right are inversion coefficients, which I'll explain in a second. Bottom left is the uh, averaging kernel, which is um, the, the, one of the main products, and then the cross-term kernel. So again, the idea of the OLA method is that we're going to add up the kernels for all the modes that we've observed in an intelligent way such that uh, the, the sum of these kernels is only localized in one area of the stellar interior. And that will allow us to deduce the speed of sound in that area of the interior by comparing that same combination of frequency differences, right? If that combination of frequency differences is non-zero, that implies a non-zero difference in the speed of sound in that area of the star. So uh, right now, I've only selected these four modes near to new max. And you can see that this averaging kernel looks very bad. We can't do anything with it. This is the target kernel. This is what we would like it to look like. But now, as I add some modes, it gets a little better. As I add another set of modes, it actually kind of gets a little worse. But as we add another set, now we get a pretty good looking kernel. Now, if we compare just the, the, this combination with the, the star, we can make some uh, pinpointed localized inferences uh, on the stellar interior. Now, for those of you who are coming from helioseismology, which I think is most of you, this probably doesn't look like that good of a kernel, but we're working with astroseismic data, so we've got to live with what we can get. Now, if we use the entire mode set, we actually get something that looks pretty darn good, I would say. There's a small bit of amplitude away from the desired region, but it's, it's, it's really small, so it's okay. We can make some pretty good inferences using this. Um, actually, the, the uh, first uh, uh, attempt at uh, astroseismic conversions was done using simulated data back in 1993 by Douglas Goff and uh, Kosovachev. And they, they kind of outlined what you'll see uh, that we confirm with, uh, with later data, which is that you can form uh, essentially four uh, well-localized averaging kernels from target radii of about 5% away from the stellar core to about 35% away. Uh, and of course, you can add averaging kernels in between, but they're, they're highly correlated. Uh, and so these are the, um, the inversions you get. But it turns out that these results were optimistic because they thought that maybe through some magic, we would precisely know the masses and radii of stars, which, of course, we do not. Um, and Sarbani showed in 2003 that these differences uh, in mass and radius between the reference model and the uh, the actual star uh, imposes um, a systematic error in the inversion result. So either we have to correct for this error by maybe averaging over all masses and radii, or we have to do dimensionless inversions, uh, but both of which we've, we've actually tried out. So here's a result, finally, finally a science result. We applied these astroseismic inversion techniques to 16 sig A and B, some 25 years later uh, after the initial astroseismic inversions on simulated data. Uh, in the case of 16 sig b, which is uh, essentially just an evolved uh, uh, counterpart of our sun, very, very solar-like star, we get broad agreement across the board. We, we can get uh, good, well-localized averaging kernels, which give us uh, nice measurements telling us that everything's okay. In the case of 16 sig a, maybe it's a little worse, but maybe it's consistent. It's hard to say with these large error bars. Remember, for the sun, the error bars are less than 1%. Here, the error bars are closer to 10%. Now here's a more, more exciting and newer uh, result, which is we've applied this technique now to a, to a star that's 20% more massive than the sun, and we see very large discrepancies between the internal speed of sound in the star and, and the actual, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and, and in the model, um, uh, with, a, with a significant gradient. And this is occurring in the radiative zone just outside of the convective core boundary. This is actually the model that I showed previously uh, a few slides ago. 
Um, so something's going on there. We tried to do some physics on this. As Sarbani mentioned, that's what we want to do, ultimately, use these stars as physical laboratories. So we created models with uh, overshoot, but that um, didn't create the uh, scale of differences that we needed to explain this inversion result. We created models with diffusion, but again, that did not help. We created models with different uh, extremes in radius and mass, but to no avail. And as sort of a sanity check, we um, we, we used a different evolution code and a different fitting method, right? I, I showed kind of two different approaches to fitting uh, these observations. But again, we don't get differences on the scale needed to explain uh, the internal structure of this star. So something is amiss, and we don't know what it is. OK, very last thing I'd like to show for you today. Um, so far, all of these inversions have been in, uh, uh, about sun-like stars or stars that are roughly in the solar neighborhood. But what happens when we evolve these stars off the main sequence? So here in the top left panel, I show an HR diagram with an evolutionary track of a star slightly more massive than the sun. Over here are the sound speed kernels, which you can see are pretty much occupying the outer layers. Down here is a frequency evolution diagram, you know, frequencies over age for radial and dipolar modes. And over here are, uh, uh, is a uh, propagation diagram. So you can see the lamb frequency, you can see the brump visala frequency. Um, here's the observable region. Here are convection zones because this star is more massive than the sun. And the, the red region, which I can I hope you can kind of see, th this is um, this is nuclear energy generation. So I'll play this movie for you. So right now the star is evolving off of the main sequence um, and as it does so, eventually nuclear reactions seize in the core and you can see that they are now continuing in a shell down here. Uh, so far nothing uh, too, too crazy is happening in terms of the frequencies, but eventually we get to a point where there are avoided crossings and you can see the extreme sensitivity to differences or perturbations to the sound speed in the inert helium core develop. And this is a very exciting prospect because this means that we can probe the core structure of subgiant stars and, and, uh, and, and infer something about the deep stellar interior. So here's a comparison of two uh, subgiant models, right? This is the relative difference in their sound speed uh, with a logarithmic axis. And as you can see, we can form one fairly well localized averaging kernel in the deep interior of the star far deeper than helio seismology allows us to probe in the sun. And what you can see on this y-axis, this is now an actual observation, uh, an actual measurement using the star Delta Eridani, um, which was observed contemporaneously by Song and Tess uh, just a few months ago. You can see that we get a, a very nice measurement, less than 1%. Uh, we find that there's less than a 1% difference between the structure of the, the subgiant core and the best fitting stellar evolution model. That's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your, your attention. Very nice talk, Earl. Uh, in your model of the Kepler star 6225, whatever, that has a convective core, right? Yes. So how do you treat convection? Do you use Ledoux, Schwarzschild, or some semi-convection prescription? Do you vary that? Yeah, so for the vanilla model, we just use uh, Schwarzschild. And then um, we, we made these uh, sort of extra models in which we've added overshoot uh, with, we just assume the radiative uh, gradient, and we use a simple step prescription for the overshoot. Have you experimented? Have you experimented at all with different forms of semiconduction? Different. No, that's a that's a good point. We should do that, but we haven't done it yet. Okay. Uh, mine is a question about the same star there. Uh, if you go back one slide, uh, have you tried different compositions, helium and well, it's a list yeah, so in our uh, fitting, we decouple uh, helium from metallicity. And so they're both free parameters. So we find the best solution in that, you know, in that volume. But uh, we have not tried individually uh, changing them. I see the point. Uh, obviously, the speed of sound is inversely proportional to mean molecular weight. So, you know, by adjusting that, but 
I, th I think there would have to be a pretty extreme adjustment to, to explain this. Hi, very nice talk. Uh, is the mixing length a free parameter? Yes, it is. And uh, do you have an opinion on this, you know, Lots of previous work sort of just set the same mixing link for an entire grid of several ev evolution models. Does that work? No, I would advise against that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty clear that, that that shouldn't be done. Any other questions? No? So let's thank again Errol. <laughs>
Um, so here are a couple of examples. The first one for um, an acoustic wave uh, with several glitches there, and the other for um, uh, a gravity wave. And basically what, uh, what you see is that exactly that thing, that uh, the perturbation, so the, 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 the y-axis shows you a measure of the perturbation. In this case, that's what, what matters. And the perturbation will repeat itself uh, cyclically in the case of the uh, acoustic modes with frequency, in the case of the gravity uh, modes with period. Um, you also see that that perturbation is not always sinusoidal. So the sinusoidal solution, it's, it's a result of the, the glitch being small, and that's what usually people treat in, in particular in the acoustic glitches. Um, you also see that the amplitude depends on frequency, and that has two origins. One has to do with the, the, what, what is being perturbed, like for instance in the case of acoustic wave, is it the sound speed itself? Is it the derivative? Is it the second derivative? The other thing is the width of the perturbation, and that's, um, that's easy to understand. Basically, if you, I've just started by saying that the perturbation needs to be on the scale comparable smaller than the uh, local wavelength. So if you now imagine Imagine changing the frequency. As you go up in frequency, for instance, in the case of acoustic modes, uh, the local wavelength is going to get smaller, and so that thing will look less and less like a glitch. And so you have this significant decrease, for instance, in this case, which I'm not going to go into the details of what this is. I'll go through that later on. Okay, so now that we've established what a glitch is and what it does to the oscillations, let me go back to the early days. So this is eight, uh, late 80s. Um, uh, Michael had just finish his PhD, so he was probably working with Jan. And this is one of the first examples that I saw of uh, discussing this perturbation, this, this cyclic uh, variability that is expected in the frequencies. Now, at the time, they were worried about, or they were trying to assess whether there was a, a magnetic field confined below the, the convective region in the sun, and they, based on models with a given magnetic intensity, they were showing that the magnetic splittings, uh, if that uh, magnetic field were there uh, should show a varia frequency dependence variation, uh, which they show here from the modes of different degree. Now, it turned out that that was never seen in the data. They, they, at the time, they were looking at the data of Duval et al., uh, 1986. Later on, that uh, was searched for in, in other data, and it was not, never found, and it was possible, uh, in particular in a work uh, from Sabani Basu in 1997, to establish a maximum value of what that magnetic field would be, uh, that maximum value being um, about 300 uh, kilogauss. But, um, the thing was there, and glitches were to be seen, and the impact of glitches were to be seen in the frequencies in, from different origins, not this one of the magnetic field. And that's what I'm going to go on through the rest of my talk with some selection, of course, otherwise um, the chair would, would not be happy. Okay, so before I go to specific cases, let me just at least give you an idea of how broad and how interesting the study of glitches is, right, uh, in terms of how, how can you probe evolution by looking at different pulsators along the, the, the HR diagram? So we think uh, we would expect glitches, so rapid variations in the structure at the base of the convective region, in particular looking at the gradient of temperature or derivative of gradient of temper temperature, which of course go along with the derivative of sound speed and second derivative of, um, uh, of sound speed. Um, and that's relevant for solar like pulsators, for instance. Then you also expect a glitch from the helium second ionization zone. So here shown for different models how that variation in the first adiabatic uh, exponent um, depends on different uh, equation states or, or different opacities. And again, we expect this to leave a signature on the, the oscillations. And that's relevant and has been found in not only solar like pulsators in the main sequence, but also in red giant phase. Now, you also expect a glitch whenever there is a drastic gradient in chemical composition, which you would expect, for instance, at the edge of the convective uh, cores, being it in the main sequence or in later phases of evolution, or in later phases yet, when you get to the white dwarfs and you have uh, these compositionally stratif very stratified stars and you have these shifts between the chemical composition in different layers. So you see that there are everywhere in the HR diagram, and this offers an enormous potential. This being said, I'm going to focus on solar-like pulsators, main sequence and red giants from now on, but uh, I thought I would give you this broader perspective to start with. And so let me um, go to the first of the cases that I want to, to, to mention, which is trying to understand um, the overshoot below the convective region of the sun and stars. And um, this uh, started early, um, 
also worked uh, with, with Michael, and, and at the time is a PhD student, Mario. Um, and um, basically, they were looking at how, if you change the temperature stratification uh, due to overshoot below the base of con convective region, how would that affect uh, your, your, um, your oscillations? And here you see the data at the time from the Big Bear Solar Observatory um, showing exactly how the frequencies are perturbed due to this, so showing this signature of the base of the convective region. And what they were trying at the time was comparing models um, with an overshoot, which would show a, a, a discontinuity in the derivative of the gradient of temperature, so in second derivative of the, of the sound speed, with models with uh, adiabatic stratified overshoot, which would should show a much stronger perturbation because they would, they would be discontinuous directly on the gradient of the temperature. And, and here is the results of comparing what the sun is doing with what the, the data was showing. And the sun is down here. And uh, basically the models uh, with adiabatic stratified overshoot are all up here. So clearly, oops, uh, so clearly uh, the data did not show any need for overshoot, at least of this type. Now, other works contemporary to that, this showed exactly the same. They set limits on the extent of overshoot of this kind. Um, but of course, the authors always stated that, but this is probably not overshoot, what overshoot looks like, right? So probably it's not adiabatic stratified. And um, numerical simulations tend uh, 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 show that that's probably in fact, true that it's not adiabatic stratified. And so later on, they went on and tried to change to see how uh, 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 the gradient, temperature gradient profile um, uh, indicated by, at the time, uh, uh, the, the, what were the, 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 the numerical simulations at the time, uh, would impact on the, on, this, uh, on, this, on the frequencies through the glitch. And what they show here, so let me go slowly, so this, this one here would be the, the, the model S, I think the dashed line, without any overshoot, so you have adiabatic stratified throughout the convective region, and then you go down, and then here this, this, this curve, this continuous curve, will show you how that was changed by suggestion of numerical simulations. And so basically you'd have a smooth transition, a, a subadiabatic uh, region still in the region uh, within the, the, the convective region, and then a smooth feed into the radiative. Uh, so now from what I told you in the beginning, um, this, of course, has a strong impact on what on the glitch because it will change completely the feature. It's no longer be, going to be a sharp thing, right? And so they repeated, they considered different models with different flavors of this and compare then with MDI data. And, um, okay, I don't want to go through the details of all that, but basically the, the dots here and the circles, the open circles show what the sun is doing, so as measured from the data of the sun. And these models here show what different flavors of this smooth, smoother gradient, temperature gradient transition uh, uh, do, and they are all in better, much better agreement than other models like the S model, I think is the one here. Yeah, uh, okay. So in these two parameters, that are the two parameters measured, two of the parameters measured from the glitch, which is the amplitude and uh, um, related to the, 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 the depth at which the glitch is, okay? So another parameter. Okay, but let me move to other stars because already uh, long ago, in 2000, in another work uh, of which Michael was a co-author, the authors were pointing out that this, would be, this can be done in stars as well, and they were exploring what they expected to get from stars. In particular stars, the very basic question is, uh, not even about overshoot, is how, how extent is a convective region, right? Because for the sun, we know that from other means. But here, we were using the glitch starter to determine the, the depth of the, of the convective region. Um, when I mean other means, is other techniques. It's still to do with the fact that there is a discontinuity there. Okay, and soon enough, they were found in other stars, um, first with the Coho data and then uh, with, the, with the Kepo data. And so I'm, I'm just going to give you a, a flavor of the results. So here on the left-hand side, you see a case in, a, in the paper 2014 when the first uh, um, solar-like uh, uh, pulsators were analyzed for this uh, from the Kepo data. And you can clearly see, this is the signature again from the base of the convectant zone. It's very clear in this case, not so clear for other stars, of some of the other stars. And here is the re are the results of a study of, of 60, 66 stars from the uh, Kepler legacy sample, um, where you see how these, this parameter that has to do with the position of the glitch, so it's essentially the acoustic radius, uh, uh, the, sorry, the acoustic depth of the, of the glitch, uh, depends on stellar parameters. In this case, uh, how it depends on mass and how it depends on age, 
it depends as we expect it to depend, basically, <laughs> decreasing with increasing, uh, with increasing mass and uh, increasing with increasing age. Now, the authors do point out that, so this is color-coded by, by temperature, and the authors do point out that once you go to slightly hotter stars, it's harder to detect the signature because the signature is small, the amplitude is small, and because the width of the modes, uh, uh, so the line width is, is getting larger, the precision of frequencies decreases, and it becomes larger, uh, the, 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 the uncertainty becomes larger, and that's part of the reason uh, of, for this spread um, on, the, on the hotter stars. Okay, but let me move to another glitch. Um, so one that I think is probably the most promising, at least from what I see in solar, main sequence solar-like stars, which is the glitch from the helium second ionization region. Now, here is a plot of the work, again, by uh, Mario and Michael uh, from 2005 now, uh, where they show basically the signature of this uh, glitch in the first adiabatic exponent uh, in intermediate mode degrees. Um, the, I don't think they, they went on to actually determine the helium from, he, from here. Something probably should be done. Of course, there's other ways to determine the helium in the sun. Uh, but one thing that was pointed out very early, I think by Douglas in the, his 1990 paper, is that this has a huge potential for stars because in stars you don't see these intermediate uh, degree modes. So you really don't have a way to cool stars. You don't have a way to assess the abundance of helium in cool stars. And if you manage to get the, the, the signature from the low degree modes that you observe in stars, then you'll be able to calibrate the helium abundance in cool stars, which is a very important thing for stellar evolution models. And so that is shown here for the case of the sun as a star, so for mode degrees uh, 0 to 3 for, from the Bison data. And you can clearly see the double signature, the, so the signature, the wider one, is from the helium uh, second ionization region, the, the rapid variation one, but I mean the, the wider one is not the smooth, the smooth component has nothing to do with it, but, but the, the wider periodic variation is to do with helium, and the, the short uh, periodic variation is to do with the base of the convective region. And so <clears throat> people go about treating this in the data and in the models by fitting a, a physically uh, um, uh, based uh, uh, expression derived from asymptotic analysis, which essentially takes three terms, a smooth component, and then uh, a term that accounts for the, the, the signal from the base of the convective region, and then a case that, um, a, a term that uh, accounts for the helium, uh, from the glitch from the helium. And uh, <clears throat> they have successfully detected that in a number of stars. This is an example for 16 C A and B, um, a binary system not too different from the sun. This is just to show you that whether you believe or not, I think, I think you, I believe it for sure, uh, that the signal is there, so there's the fit and the different components. And then what you have to do is, one thing is to measure the parameters from this fit. That's model independent. You measure your fit, you measure the parameters. The other thing is, what can you extract from that? And that is model dependent. You really have to, 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 to go from the parameters of the glitch that you measure to the physics or to the helium content, then you need to have models behind. And that's important to keep in mind, or to the depth, if you want to go to the real depth of the, of the of the uh, glitch, you, you have to have models. And so what they did was uh, to consider models that were consistent with the observables, both the, the classical and the seismic observables. They have a set of models exploring different physics that are uh, consistent with it, and then they took the frequencies from those models, they took the frequencies from the star itself, they apply exactly the same method on both to extract the parameters from the glitch, and then they ask which models are consistent with the glitch that we are observing. And here you see uh, for both uh, uh, components of the binary, um, different colors are two different models considered, and you see how the, the amplitude of the glitch depends very significantly and correlates very well with the helium abundance, and so they were able to, by considering the observations here within the one thing within these two lines, they were able to, to determine uh, the, the helium abundance in these two stars. And then they went on and they did that for uh, the Kepler legacy sample and they determined for 38 stars. Now there's a very interesting work also following on that, uh, which I won't have time to talk about, but I can talk about if you ask me in the end, which is using these to constrain the mixing, um, the, the, the extra mixing below the convective region um, in stars that are more Massive, like in F stars, uh, which is a, we know it's a problem. Atomic diffusion just depletes completely um, helium, and we, we know that doesn't happen in practice. And so this can be used to check competitive processes that allow um, that helium not to disappear completely from the envelope. Let me move on the last few minutes. Let me move to the last topic I wanted to talk, which is close to my heart, 
which is red giants, and the glitches in, um, in, the, in, in, the, in the interior layers, or in the core of these stars. Now, let, before I do that, let me just remind you, like uh, I think several people mentioned already, that these stars are a little bit more complicated because the modes that we observe are mixed modes. So they are modes that have a dual character. They, in the interior, they are maintained by, by buoyancy. In the outer layers, they are maintained by the, the, the perturbation to the gradient of pressure. So um, you basically, it's very good because they, they hold information about the whole star, but it also means that you're dealing with more complicated uh, modes. And the impact of that is that when you look at the period spacing, so separation between two consecutive modes of the same degree, um, instead of having a, f a constant, or essentially a constant, which you'd have for G modes, which is this line up here, which is the asymptotic one, uh, the asymptotic value, uh, in these stars, you don't have a constant period spacing. You have the period spacing going down. Now, this is a function of frequency, not period, note that, going down every time you reach a, 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 a frequency of which where you'd have a pure acoustic mode. And this has to do with the coupling, optimal coupling of the wave at those frequencies, right? And so this is the period spacing you have to be worried about without glitch. What happens if now you have a glitch or so rapid variation in the Brunt-Vassal frequency, okay? It depends on where it is, et cetera. I just show you an example here for a, a, a model. This is for an RG, uh, RGB model. And in this particular case, you won't be able to see it, but basically you can see the, the effect of the glitch, or you could see if I zoomed it, the effect of the glitch here where on the top of the period spacing. But then what you do see is a clear effect of modulation on the, on, on the deep step that uh, on the dips associated to each acoustic um, resonance. Now, how do you go about uh, um, getting information from these glitches? Well, you have to do what was done for, for, for in the other cases. You have to build a function, uh, preferentially uh, an analytical function that is physically motivated. So again, derived from asymptotics where you understand what your amplitude, your, what your parameters mean, right? And you do it and then you fit it to the data, right? So we've worked on that, um, collaboration of several people that are here actually, um, over the past few years, um, and we developed a, an asymptotic expression that could be fitted to these, as well as to pure G modes. Uh, and, uh, and, and basically, um, Matthew Vrat went on trying to fit that to the data and trying to find glitches um, in the data of red giants, in particular red giants in the, in, in the helium core burning phase. And why is that important? Well, because in the helium core burning phase, you have a convective core and you have something happening at the border of the convective core, which you don't quite know what it is. Uh, I mean, you don't exactly know and you want to test how this mixing beyond the convective core appears, uh, uh, takes place, and what profile you may expect. So these are, that is illustrated here in a, a figure from a work by Diego Bossini. I think some of the models they consider here, they already ruled out based on period, average period spacing and so on, but in any case, just to illustrate that for different types of overshoot or penetration, um, they, they would get not only different sizes of the convective core, but different profiles outside the convective core and rapid variation changes in the Brunt Vassal frequency, which would induce glitches in the data. So Matthew Vrat went look for those. He considered, um, I'm going to give you an example here, but basically consider a sample of 300, um, 300 uh, red, giant, uh, red giant stars in that phase, um, uh, even burning phase, uh, with comparable um, signal to noise, and so among the best that he could, he could find. And um, he used a technique that I don't have time to describe here, but it's, this is a stretch period shell. So it's like an shell diagram, except that here is period shell because it's for the G modes, not for, well, it's, in this case, it's, it's mixed modes, but he's looking at the, prop the G mode properties. Um, and basically, this stretch, stretching of the variable essentially allows you to get rid of these dips uh, due to the coupling, because what you want to look, or what you look for, is something beyond that. So one thing is the, the variation in the period due to the coupling, the other things on top of that, variations due to rotation, due to uh, glitches, etc. So in, 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 in summary, if this were, if there were no glitch here and no rotation, you should expect a straight, uh, sorry, you should expect, expect a straight line here in this diagram, okay? For this case, you clearly don't have a straight line. Um, the errors are, in, in, are small. I'm not going to claim the fit is very good because clearly for some of the frequencies here, the errors are quite small. Uh, but you do see something there and uh, uh, 
I don't know if the problem is with the errors or if the problem is with the, the model because we are considering a single glitch. There could be additional short, uh, uh, I mean, anything on the Brunt-Vassala on its derivatives will generate a pattern and on different scales depending on the position where the glitch is. So I don't know, but he, he, the, the, this is a kind of fit he got. And he found, and I'm, I'm finishing, Rafa, uh, he found that out of the, hundred, the 300 stars that he studied, he found only 23 that ha showed uh, uh, something. So most of the stars do not show something, which I think is a puzzling thing to start with, that some do and others don't. Um, he, he basically also finds that the, the, the parameters he gets back, so the amplitudes and, uh, sorry, the amplitudes and the, the, the buoyancy depth, so it's to do with the position of the glitch, do not seem to vary significantly with period spacing. Now, the period spacing here, the period spacing during this phase of evolution, um, it increases, and then at the end, it starts decreasing. So this is not exactly a measure of evolution, but it, it, is, it is related to. It doesn't seem to be a, a significant um, change. But I think the most puzzling um, of it is that when he considers the population that he studied, 300 stars, the properties of the, those population, of that population, and the, the, the properties of these 23 stars, there doesn't seem to be any difference. So no metallicity difference, um, no period spacing difference, which being, if this is true, if what we're really seeing is a glitch thing here near the core of the, of the and, and the values of the positions are compatible with being at the edge of the core. So I forgot to say that. But if, if this is what we're seeing, then this would point to a transient thing or something that happens or comes and goes, which of course is pure speculation, but, but it's, it's interesting, it's a puzzle, we need to understand it. Okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm there. <laughs> so I just wanted to, to tell you again that I think it's clear that the signatures of glitches uh, in, seismic, in seismic data provide um, really constraints on uh, uh, on physical aspects. Some of them are the most complex aspects that we need to model to have good evolutionary, evolutionary uh, models. Um, so that, that's an important thing. There were many things that I didn't discuss. I didn't discuss the, the use of glitches to determine that thing that I, I mentioned about the extra mixing below the convective region, which is uh, for more massive stars is very important. More massive meaning F stars here. Um, I also didn't talk about the use of these signatures in forward modeling, which has been done already and has been shown very nicely that it can break the degeneracy between helium and mass in your solutions um, when you use it in your forward modeling. And of course, I didn't talk, and I apologize to some of the people. I don't know if Steve is still here. Um, not, I didn't talk about a, a number of other cases of stars like white dwarfs and, 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 and STBs, uh, which, which I think are very promising, particular STBs I think are very promising at this moment. And I hope that uh, we'll get more from uh, continuous viewing zone of TESS and play too. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have to say that you were very sharp with the time, so <laughs> great. No glitch. No glitch on the time. No glitch on the time. <laughs> Thank you. That, that was fast. Yeah. <laughs> and and very, very interesting. The uh, analysis of the clump star in particular, mm. and the interesting thing is that you only find glitches in, in a few of them. If you look at models of clump stars, the frequency spectrum is completely destroyed by, by glitches, glitch effects. It's very hard for the models to get a regular fr uh, frequency uh, or period shell diagram. Mm -hmm. So stars are doing something that models are not doing. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a selection effect here. You only analyze the cases where you can see the, the GMOs clearly in, with a regular structure. So it may be that some of the stars where you can't see that might correspond closer, more closely to the models with more glitches and sharper features in the glitches. So would you like to comment on that? Yeah, so the selection criteria here was based on, of course, on the detectability, on, on the detectability clear detectability of the ICO-1 modes. Now, I'm not expert on the observations, of course, as you know, of red giants. Um, I don't see that that selection criteria will uh, imply a significant selection within the clamp phase. Uh, so, of course, if you're talking about the red giant branch, then, of course, that's a very important selection criteria because the modes are disappear, the mixed modes disappear as far as, as soon as you go high in, in luminosity. During the clamp phase, 
I don't think that is the case. And actually, if you look at the plots, you see that they cover quite a wide period spacing. So they cover quite a, a, a significant phase of evolution. I don't know if, if all or not. I don't know if someone expert on red giant observations can tell me, can answer better than me that. But I don't think it's that selective in that respect. So I think models are just wrong. Okay, any other questions? We have still time. And Margarita can take the time. No? Okay. It was very clear. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we arrived nearly to the, to the end of the session. I mean, the, the serious part of the session. And we are going to start the funny part of the session. So every So we are going to do the poster session. So I would like to invite everybody that has a poster and going to present the one minute presentation of their slide that they sent to align there. Mm. So there are two posters that will not be presented, which is P4 and P15. So for the rest of the people, just align there, starting with P1. I don't, John. So I will run in the... Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, you can maybe probably stay here with the microphone. Let's so get. So I'm going. I have a strict instruction of the SOC, which I am part of. Um, I will be running the time, and after one minute, I will switch to the next one. So the follower. One should two. take the phone, the, the, the microphone, if the, uh, if the presenter don't give you the phone, it's your, it's your business, so you have yes, to take it. Uh, one, two, oh. three. That's, it's on. Of course, what happened to it. Thank you. <laughs> You're in yeah. row A. Should be on number one. Yeah. We just need to give it a second. You may be old enough to remember the gong show on television when they rang hmm. a gong at the end. So the time is up, like so. The two and then the one. At we'll pound a gong. So. There it goes. So, yeah, there is no, no. gong. The, 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 the blue. light will be changed. So you have to look uh, to this light and pick up the phone, uh, the, phone the, uh, the microphone. I thought it was going there. I go to two, don't talk. And the one. I will, I will present a poster also, so I will have a few more minutes than the rest. That's for sure. That's absolutely normal. Great. I don't need it. Oh, give it down here. So yes, please. Uh, Laurent and I wanted to uh, recall uh, some of Michael's uh, extraordinary contributions beyond his own research, uh, beyond his own institutions, uh, to the community at large. Uh, he's had a, a huge uh, impact uh, on our profession and, and on our lives. Uh, here are a few uh, hi highly selective examples. Excuse me, uh, get close to the mic. Uh, first international member of the Gong Scientific Advisory Committee, et cetera. And you can read them uh, faster th than I can. Uh, he was very generous of his time uh, in supporting the community at large. Uh, and let me uh, just conclude uh, by recalling uh, Reka's uh, uh, comment. Let me recall what Reka recalled of Michael's comment uh, about citizenship. Michael was a citizen of our community. Uh, he was a sage, uh, extraordinary, exemplary citizen of our community. A lesson for us all and will be sorely missed. Time. Hi, uh, my name is Piyush Agarwal. I'm a grad student here at CU Boulder. Uh, my advisor, Mark Rath, came with a, uh, with a brilliant idea of applying the helioseismic inversion techniques to solar spectroplanetic data uh, to invert for the solar uh, photospheric uh, atmospheric, atmospheric profile. So uh, currently we are like hacking out the details of doing multivariable inversion and also and writing an iterative code. 
so we're trying to ensure that the, uh, when you're doing multivariate inversion, uh, the dominant variable, uh, the most sensitive variable does not eat up the uh, sensitivity, uh, eat up the contribution from the low uh, sensitive uh, variables. Uh, please come and look at my poster if you want to talk more about it. Uh, hello. So our goal is to understand the base structure and dynamics of active regions beneath the solar surface. And so this basically tells you that we need a better understanding of the interactions between the acoustic wave propagation and the magnetic field. And the forward modeling and numerical simulations, they show that when the, the modes of the acoustic waves leak through the active region, they propagate upwards, and at some point, like beta is equal to one layer, they propagate downwards to the interior, and by doing that, they, 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 not, they, they, they uh, contaminate the signature of the acoustic waves that we're using. So our goal is to understand this process, so use multi-height. So since we are, the waves is propagating upwards, we need multi-height data. So we are using multi-height SDO data and the HMI vector magnetic field data for few active regions to see how the wave propagates and if the waves, they return back or they reflect back to the interior. Time. And do we do see that? You know, <laughs> and support so more results in a post. Hello, I feel like I should uh, face this way because there's more people standing than sitting. <laughs> so my poster is more about space weather. I wanted to be here for an opportunity for cross-pollination. For example, talk to me if you're interested in some ideas I have about if there's distinct classes of uh, solar cycles. So anyway, now to the poster. Um, the working assumption of electrical companies is basically that they have an average of three days to prepare for what's coming. But uh, the poster talks about how the uh, higher energy storms are the faster ones, so there's actually less time. Oh, so small. So uh, we try to uh, examine the uh, what, what causes the central limb effect in highly seismology measurements. When we do the central limb, central limb measurements, you know, one, one side, one point is located in the disk center side, which is a lower atmosphere, and in the other is on the limb side, which is a higher atmosphere. So when we do measurements for sunspots, one point is located in the sunspots, which is a lower atmosphere because of Wilson depression. And the other point is in the outside from the sense box, which is a higher atmosphere. So we think just because of the measurements of different atmospheric heights that can cause some travel time asymmetry. To examine that, we, we select two lines of, of HMI and uh, we, we measure from one lower atmosphere to the higher atmosphere and then we measure the backwards. It looks like just because of different measurement heights that can cause a travel time asymmetry. Um, and this trial time asymmetry shows some uh, frequency dependence. So I think this uh, could be a caution to all of us that a measurement just using, using different atmospheric heights can time. cause travel time asymmetry. So in this poster, we present a number of recent results that have come out of the Center for Space Science at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Uh, a, re a recent group that was established in 2015 um, and that focuses on solar uh, physics, stellar physics, as well as exoplanet science. Uh, the four uh, results that are presented are about uh, stellar latitudinal differential rotation. You've heard the talk from uh, Otman already. Uh, a, uh, some work about ring diagram analysis and how it can be used to study Rossby waves um, in uh, using gong data. Then we have uh, some work by uh, Jishnu Bhattacharya on uh, time distance helio seismology of supergranulation and finding something about the, time. the dynamics of the atmospheres of hot Jupiters. <laughs> I'll keep going by, <laughs> from the previous slide by saying that Mike, Mike Thompson actually uh, helped us uh, win an extension of this uh, NYU Abu Dhabi Center for Space Science for the next five years, so uh, something I wanted to, to stress. Now, in this poster, uh, we work on uh, uh, the uh, 
ways to improve far side imaging using uh, uh, some techniques of local area seismology. Um, what is important here is that we have a new formulation of this problem and uh, we use uh, accurate Green's function to propagate the, the waves. Um, great, go and see the poster. <laughs> now, this one is, <laughs> so this one, <laughs> so this one is um, uh, a summary of the, all the recent, uh, recent results that we've obtained on uh, Rosby waves. So we present the, um, the discovery paper of global scale Rosby waves in the solar interior. You see here a sectoral power spectrum that shows a dispersion relation that's very, very close to the uh, textbook dispersion relation that you'd expect from these waves. Uh, on the very left, you have a confirmation of these results with time distance area seismology that's, that shows individual uh, uh, power spectra for individual modes. You see some uh, very nice uh, quality factors for, this, for these waves. And we think that ultimately we'll be doing seismology with Rosby waves, thanks to this uh, very nice quality factor. And so we started working on uh, calculating eigenfunctions. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm part of the MPS team studying Rossby waves. Uh, maybe we should call this the Blitzkrieg effect. But, uh, so um, we use uh, uh, deep focus time distance helioseismology to uh, measure the points on the, uh, with the air bars in this plot. And uh, so the idea is that you uh, see uh, an RMS travel time uh, with the errors calculated by uh, uh, Monte Carlo calculation and compared with uh, some different models. And uh, so uh, we used the previous uh, results to uh, fix what the surface amplitude is. And so we have a, a model with a very small say two megameter eigenfunction and nothing below. That's the bottom curve. And uh, the top curve <laughs> is... Uh, okay, so um, I'm the third author on this. Um, you can find, so on this work, I'm probing the variation with depth of solar Mariano flow using Legendre function decomposition. So basic idea is to measure the frequency shift between poleward and equatorward propagating wave power ridges and by applying Legendre function decomposition of the, both the first and second kind in this annular region, and then compare the results with forward modeled frequency shift, which is given, given the profile, that profile, the latitude averaged uh, in Mariano flow, and then uh, here are sensitivity functions, and then the results are shown in the bottom panels for different uh, depth profiles, and you can see that the basic results is that the, uh, the, the equator, uh, sorry, poleward flow basically persists all the way down to about 50 megameters at least. So you can see the details at the poster. Thank you. Hello. Um, my poster is about the uh, multi-age fading code for ring time analysis. And, and the code was developed by Benjamin Greer in Boulder, and we, uh, we revisited the code and updated the model and some method. And the Monte Carlo test shows that the um, update gives the uh, improvement in, in, in terms of the error estimate and less bias compared to the original one. But the uh, bias is not, too, not so large enough to solve the uh, famous discrepancy between the time distance and ring diagram mentioned by Aaron yesterday. So luckily all the co-workers are here at the meeting, so please catch us for more detail. Thank you. Uh, like many of you, I learned inversions uh, from Michael, um, both from his papers and him standing over my shoulder, staring down at whatever I was doing. And, um, and for, for a long time, um, I've been trying to apply OLA type inversions for problems in local helioseismology. Um, lately, I've been exploring other uh, ways of, of doing inversions, and um, the poster 13 talks about a 
probabilistic or Bayesian MCMC type inversion for problems that that's suitable for, such as maybe meridional circulation or supergranulation. And um, so from exploring a, an inversion like that and comparing to OLA type inversion, I think there's a lot of promise. These types of inversions are done a lot in other fields. They're done for making measurements, kind of, but they haven't been used too much in, in time distance helioseismology, and that's what this poster talks about. So come take a look. Thank you. My, my poster is about how we can simplify inversions for meridional flows and other large scale flows in the sun by uh, reducing the 3D inverse problem to a 1.5D inverse problem for the spherical harmonic coefficients of the flow. This actually achieves two things at the same time. Firstly, it reduces the number of parameters drastically, making the problem amenable to a Bayesian uh, inverse or inversion or any, uh, some other technique like that. At the same time, it also lets us incorporate several systematic effects such as line of sight projection as well as different observation heights. Uh, we have heard several uh, talks and posters on these lines. And this poster just lets you incorporate all of this into the physics of the kernels instead of having to subtract them by hand. And so if you are interested in this, please take a look at poster 14. So this poster, if you want to really know all the gory details, just come and you know, talk to me. So the idea here is to try to see whether we can see any uh, indicator of pre-emergence you know, of active regions. So what actually looked at around 24 active regions that are emerging close to the central meridian, and I essentially tracked them before and after, and actually tried to do, uh, you know, use that uh, acoustic power or uh, time anomaly using time distance, see whether there's any signal. There is a clear signal once the uh, active region has emerged. Emerged, sorry. Uh, just before emergence, there is really no smoking gun. The real problem here is how do you try to improve statistics by merging together active regions that are actually so different, you know. They're really so different, so you can just simply average them. So that's the real question. And essentially looking at that has opened more questions. Time. Um, All right. Um, uh, flows around active regions have been were one of the early discoveries in local helioseismology. It turns out that they're actually a challenge to measure because they're relatively weak flows embedded in a very strong supergranulation field. So things like a lot of what we know is based on 15 degree aver spatial averages, the ring diagram. So what I do here is something a little different, and that is ensemble averaging. We pick. Uh, sort active regions uh, according to some property that we're interested in, like flux, and, and average over uh, many hundreds, if not thousands, of active regions. And so we've made a number of new discoveries, including the fact that uh, weak active regions have inflows and other uh, flow features that are almost as large as uh, larger active regions, several orders of magnitude of flux larger. So their contribution to global dynamics, such as torsional oscillation and renal circulation, could be very strong. Thank you. Perfect time. Hi, I'm Alec Herzig from New Mexico State, and my poster number 18 is uh, some preliminary thoughts on the idea that on the idea that perhaps um, convective blue shift might play some role in the center to limb effect that we see, the systematic error in helioseismology. Uh, this is motivated purely because these two different effects have um, some very similar qualitative behaviors, and um, the idea here is to use uh, an artificial data set of Doppler grams to which we can apply different convective blue shift profiles or correct for convective blue shift uh, to remove that from the uh, Doppler gram data sets and then run uh, time distance helioseismology to see if we get any differences uh, between different profiles or the re uh, removal of the profiles from the center to limb effect. Hello everyone. Uh I'm Beshek from UC Santa Cruz, and I'm presenting poster number 19 on solar hemispheric uh, uh, helicity selection rules. Uh, in this work, we revisit some of the uh, extensively studied uh, flux tube simulations, uh, basically transport of flux tube from solar interior towards the surface. And we show some uh, interesting results of how you can get solar hemispheric helicity rules out of just the flux tube twist. 
without requiring any rotation or convection. Uh, uh, this poster is on the search of solar minima. Oh, okay. Uh, I think now you can hear me. Yeah. yeah. So this poster is uh, on the search of solar minima below the surface in different layers of the sun. In, uh, so in, the, uh, in these three um, columns you can see, first is for the minima 22, 23. In all four layers, I, can, I have characterized them with convection zone, tachocline region, radiative zone, and the core. So minima sensed by the, uh, in, all three, in all four layers were the same for minima 22, 23. In 23, 24, uh, core sensed the minimum one year prior to the actual minimum and for uh, current uh, minimum, we are still waiting for the more data, but we can see in the bottom right plot, there is a slight uh, upward turn in the core region. So perhaps we will see the same feature what we had seen in the previous minimum. So this uh, tells us the more complex relationship between magnetic field and the uh, frequencies uh, below the surface. It is not the straightforward, what we have thought. Okay, my, my poster is about interaction between subsurface flows and magnetic activity. And one example that one can study is activity complexes, things where activity comes round and round again, lives for five to seven or more solar rotations. And one of the questions is, of course, what holds this together? Well, one of the notion has been it's the, the twist of the magnetic fields. And so, yes, indeed, we can show that the, that the kinetic helicity of the flows increases if you have a longer lifetime. So yes, so that seems to be the, that is one of the connections. The other thing is activity complexes are also locations. Uh, the notion is they have produced a very flare productive, okay? And so, and yes, we can also show that that, that goes up, but you would say, well, things that live longer produce more, big deal. But no, 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 it's, it's what it really is, is that if an, if an activity is, if a complex is, if, if a thing is part of an activity complex that lives long, then the chances that they produce flares is much greater than if the same thing lives in a short one. Thank you. And that's it. Hi, my posture is mainly about the asymmetry in torsional oscillation and meridional flow at different hemispheres and depths. So we see that there is a, uh, there is a strong asymmetry in the flows at all the latitudes and the near surface depths where, which we have observed. Also, we see that the asymmetry in velocity, both the torsional oscillation and the meridional flow is strongly correlated with the magnetic cycle, asymmetry in the magnetic cycle. We see that asymmetry in the torsional velocity precedes the asymmetry in the magnetic cycle by about 1.2 to 1.4 years, while that of the meridional flow precedes the cycle asymmetry by 3.1 to 3.6 years. For more details, please visit question number 22. Thank you. Um, I represent uh, a new reconstruction of the sunspot, sunspot group number series for the past 300 years. The uh, one main difference from previous uh, reconstructions is that there is no long-term variation over the 300 years. Uh, most other uh, reconstructions are too low by a fact by some 40% starting at cycle 11 and going back in time. Our new reconstruction does not show uh, that effect, so there is no long-term trend over the past three centuries. In particular, that means that the past 60 years or so are not or have not been the most active in the past 12,000 years that is often claimed. I'm Lauren Matelski, uh, working at Jilla with Yuri Tumre, um, and we've been doing uh, 3D global MHD simulations of rotating spherical shell convection. Um, and we've been seeing in a few new models uh, two interesting cycles, one reminiscent of the solar butterfly diagram with equatorward propagation and regular reversals, and the other is an asymmetric mode that preferentially occupies one hemisphere um, and also has peaks on 180 degrees opposite on the sphere, reminiscent of active longitudes um, and hemispheres. So we're trying to see if these modes could be operating in the sun, uh, responsible for some of the observations from uh, HMI and um, SDO. 
You are going too fast. Hi, I'm, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jacob Noonwaite. I'm a student at UC Santa Cruz. And in poster 25, I'm presenting a uh, study of the influence of turbulence on an essentially nonlinear dynamo. Um, what's referred to as essentially nonlinear dynamo is a system in which um, dynamo action will only be triggered if the initial magnetic field configuration is strong enough and past a critical value. And so that is, it doesn't have a linear instability that grows from uh, infinitesimal perturbations in the magnetic field. There has to be an initially strong enough field present. Um, and the model that um, the study is based on is performed in a quiescent, uh, non-turbulent environment. And so in this study, we're analyzing the effects of uh, different turbulent models on this type of system. Thank you. So, so that's a poster of my PhD student and a bunch of people. So the poster is divided in, in two parts. So the first part is just a comparison of all the global uh, seismic uh, instruments, LEO seismic instruments, uh, which is part of the collaboration we want to do for the, uh, for the rotation project of Mike. And uh, well, you can see the, the results there uh, for 20 something years. And in the right hand side of the, of the poster, uh, it's, a, it's a new initiative which is called Solar Sun, which is the use of the Sun spectro, uh, spectrophotometer, uh, spectro, spectrograph uh, to do with, uh, with the Sun. And uh, because I am the chair, I have half a minute more. Uh, and then, because we win already this half a minute. So you can see the performances of the, of the, sol, of the Solar Song instrument compared to Golf uh, and, um, and Virgo. And uh, the idea is to use the, this Solar Song to, to look at different heights in the atmosphere and try to beat a little bit the granulation noise. Following on with the uh, multiple height uh, concept, we've taken velocity measurements at three different heights in the atmosphere, and we've looked at the dispersion relations for waves by, uh, through the phase difference signal we get from the cross spectrum. Um, from this, we're able to make maps, spatial maps of the sound speed, the radiative damping, uh, the acoustic cutoff frequency, and also the height difference between the, obser uh, the observations. Uh, we're focusing on the acoustic cutoff frequency because, uh, as you can see here, there are regions where there's uh, very high acoustic cutoff frequencies, which uh, means that we have high reflectivity, and this has been reflected in several helioseismic observations over the years. Uh, the last thing is, with the acoustic cutoff frequency, we believe we can see the signature of flares um, being reflected in these maps. Okay, so we've done some big hydrocode simulations. Well, they're actually pretty small. And uh, you can see some standing waves. There's a power spectrum in the upper left. Lower left, you can get eigenfunctions out of that. They're not entirely real. They don't look like what you expect from standard models. Got those ones. You patch the eigenfunctions onto the top of the solar model. And you can predict the surface time. What you need to look at is the dotted line. That's what uh, Roy Ball got. Uh, we recalculated his frequencies um, with whatever particular measure we did. Get the solid line. So that's the difference between the frequencies of the ball, ball model and the observed frequencies. The dashed line is the prediction that we have of the physical effects that we're not taking into account in the ball model. And you can see the differences we're talking about are something like 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And you can notice a little sinusoidal variation, which is probably just some structural problem in the model. I'm Tom Brack at Space Science Institute here in Boulder. Um, yeah, that was a quick introduction to the surface effect. That's what I'm playing with too. Um, I want to, as Jasper, not to correct for it, uh, but actually do a forward calculation. There are two parts to it. There's a structural part, which is due to convective expansion of the atmosphere. And then uh, all the non-ideal effects, which also take place in the surface layers, um, the non-adiabatic uh, interactions between mode and convection. Uh, I have some, uh, so I extract that from 3D simulations. And there are eigenfunctions in one plot, there are work integrals, and then uh, non-adiabatic pressure fluctuations, which gives rise to all these non-adiabatic effects. Preliminary work still. Hi, my name is Robert Loper, and I'm from the Air Force Institute of Technology, uh, and I'm working on uh, uh, 
basically putting together the uh, standard solar model with uh, some semi-classical MHD to try to deduce the uh, nature of the plasma in the solar core. And what I'm finding is that the solar core is kind of a strange place, uh, a place where we can't really ignore quantum mechanics or relativity. Uh, for example, so in the, the picture I have in the center there, I have the, um, the, pro the ions are basically uh, collected into a, a very metallic solid. Um, the electrons will propagate as waves. Uh, so all of that results in a, a phase transition at the core radiative zone interface, which can allow magnetic field formation. Thank you. Hi, and my name is Jiao Guo from Penn State. So in this work, we're trying to measure the granulation time scale and amplitude in the power spectrum RV time series. Uh, this has been done for the Kepler photometry, but not for real velocities. So uh, you can see uh, on the left, we have this uh, granulation time scale and function mu max, which uh, follow this scaling relations very well. And on the right, it's the granulation amplitude and the function mu max. So if you're uh, interested, check out uh, poster number 31, which happens to be a prime number. So I'm Angela, and we started this project when I moved to Boulder and started to collaborate with Michael together with Savit and Rafa. And the goal of this work was to study or is to study the limits of uh, in seismic inversions for radial differential rotation of solar uh, type stars. And uh, we use artificial data and try to access in which conditions we can recover the properties of the, uh, the rotational profile that we input in the model. Uh, so if you are interested, please come to see the poster number 32. Thank you. You can all slow down a little bit. We are faster and faster. So we'll just go ahead. Okay, I'll just start talking then. My name is Saskia Hecker, and together with Yvonne Answer, George Angelou, and Sabani Basu, we have been looking at the red joint branch bump. This is essentially the short phase of decrease in luminosity that we have before the stars increase the luminosity again. Um, naively, one would think that this is caused by the uh, shell burning hitting the uh, mean molecular weight discontinuity, but Jörn has shown a few years ago that actually only happens at the luminosity minimum. So we are interested in what causes the luminosity maximum. Um, we link this in this work to the mirror, which is essentially the expansion of the outer layers of the stars with the simultaneous contraction in the core, and we see that there is no mirror during the bump phase. If you don't want to know why and how, please talk to either me, Sabani, or Yvonne, who are in the audience. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm presenting the work of uh, Stefano Garcia that was working with us for six months. Basically, what he does is we're interested in knowing, um, have a control experiment, experiment to see how glitches in the Brunta Sala frequency affect the frequencies. And so he built two codes that are simple codes that are available in, in GitHub, so anyone can get them, where the first one, you take an AMDL file, you basically suppress the glitches that are there in a smart way, and in a way that uh, by changing artificially the gamma one profile so that you still respect uh, the equations, and then in the second part, he basically introduces a glitch. That way we can predict glitch whatever we want. And then he tests the science, and that panel there is very interesting because it shows that glitches on opposite sides of the, of the cavity have very different effects on the frequencies, as expected theoretically, but it was the first confirmation of that. Oh, and then I should go slower, right? Yeah, according to you. So can we move to the next one? I'm also telling that one. Okay, so this is another poster presented by, it's a work present, uh, developed by a couple of students that work with us. It's looking at 16CA um, and basically asking the questions of can we... Um, constrain better the, the, the phase of evolution of this star, so in particular the hydrogen content in the core, by looking at the ratios. So what they did was they picked the solutions from forward modeling, considering classic and, and, uh, and, non and seismic constraints, and from that solu those solutions they computed uh, the ratios, they also computed the ratios for the true observations of the star, they fitted them using an expression that was first uh, suggested by uh, by, by Duval's et al. And they get the two parameters, A0 and A1, and then they, what you see on the, on the two right panels, the low one is the most interesting one, is how those parameters depend on the hydrogen content and the core. And you can see that they completely 
uh, they, they change as the hydrogen change. So you can separate them. Now, the bar, there is a three sigma error bar of the observations. That star there contains a three sigma error bar. So you can see how much you can constrain, uh, select between the models, and also put a constraint on the hydrogen content of the star. Thank you. Hi, my name is Connor Bice. I'm a grad student here in Boulder working with Yuri Tomre. Um, and I do global MHD simulations of stellar interiors. And I'm particularly interested in early M dwarfs, or M dwarfs in general, but today I'm talking about early M dwarfs. Um, so these stars are uh, just barely too massive to be fully convective. So I'm particularly interested in what difference does it even make that they might have a tacho climb. So uh, the poster I'm presenting today, it's over in the corner if you'd like to come see it, is uh, dedicated to just what feedbacks does the tachocline provide on the magnetism for these stars. And in studying this, I've found a couple, uh, a couple ways that it has an influence, especially on cycle periods, and uh, it also has some relevance for gyrochronology and uh, super flares. So if you'd like to hear why, please come talk to me. Uh, hi, my work is on astro-seismology of lambda Bootis stars which are A-type stars which are unusually metal deficient in their surface layers and of unknown providence. The idea is, can we use astro-seismology to differentiate between possible internal structures, which is interesting on the point that many of the uh, lambda Buddha stars are bright and canonical A-type objects. For example, Vega on the left-hand side. We also consider the application of this work to Tycho B, a lambda Buddha star which is located near the center of Tycho's supernova remnant, and has been proposed as the companion that donated mass to the white dwarf that is eventually exploded. And if we could confirm through astro-seismology what the structure of Tycho B, this lambda boost star, is, it would be a real insight into the physics of type 1a supernova. If you want to know what we found, I guess you'll have to come talk to me. So, thank you very much to all the speakers. We did it really well, too much. So, I don't know, we have an announcement. So, Ma Margarita, you can come here and finish your talk. <laughs>